Okay, hey again. So I'm Prasanna. I'm a research staff member at IBM Research. And uh, I'll talk about our efforts in trusted, trustworthy AI or trusted AI. Um, before I start, let's look at the agenda. Um, so I'm going to introduce uh, trusted AI from a perspective. And uh, followed by that, I'll talk, I'll do a deep dive into our AI Fairness 360 toolbox, talk a little bit in depth about the fairness metrics and the bias mitigation algorithms. And uh, after the coffee break, Amit is here. He'll talk about our explainability work and the toolbox that we have in that area. And uh, we have a packed session after the lunch as well. Uh, it uh, focuses on trustworthy generation of data. We have pretty interesting talks from uh, invited speakers. And then we finally have a panel in the end. So. Let's head over to my presentation. OK, so, so agenda for my talk is going to be uh, introduce what is trustworthy machine learning or AI. Uh, I'll talk about the pillars of trust that we like to think uh, trusted AI in terms of. And then uh, I'll do a deep dive into algorithmic fairness and the toolbox. And probably, if we have time, we'll do some demos around the toolbox. And um, so yeah, let's get started. So we as techn technology consumers are sort of interacting with AI uh, systems or AI services in our day-to-day -day life, right? So we all are familiar with home assistants, chatbots, uh, we are sort of constantly exposed to the recommendation engines and so on and so forth, right? So we're not really new to being uh, exposed to AI or interacting with AI systems. So what are the value propositions of using AI? So why, do we, uh, why is there a push to use AI in all kinds of industries? So first of all, it really increases effectiveness right, of existing processes. So we can think that uh, we can improve on critical things like cancer detection or all kind of industrial problems, right? So all these things lead to uh, happier customers, right? If you increase effectiveness, the customers are going to be happy. And in general, the society uh, should move forward, right? The other key benefit is reduced cost. So cost could be thought of as uh, what is the actual cost rate, right? And the time it takes to do a particular task. So AI can reduce the cost through automation, right? So customer care and a lot of other fields can really benefit from that. And it also reduces the time to perform any particular task, right? So, um, so, so combined, uh, they actually reduce the cost that is associated with any particular application, right? And it also unlocks new processes, right? And something that we never thought could be done could, can, can be done much easily using AI. So uh, it has benefits in terms of accuracy. It also has benefits in terms of cost. So, <coughs> so these benefits mean that more and more AI is being pushed into areas which were uh, never really exposed to AI before. right? And the thing that we really care about are these high-stake decisions that AI is being used now. Some examples that I've showed here, uh, it could be financial sector, right, where uh, we want to, uh, the credit loan applications are being automated using AI. Employment decisions, in many cases, AI is being used to make critical decisions. And then uh, admission decisions, we've seen that a lot of places uh, AI is being used there as well. And uh, prison sentencing as well. So, so it's really uh, going into these high stakes areas and the key question that uh, we should think is how do we enable trust in AI so that we can really uh, uh, speed up the adoption in these kind of areas and unlock all the benefits that AI can provide, right? So we like to think in these four questions when we think of trust in a particular AI system. So is it fair, right? So the first question, is it really fair? Is it easy to understand? Is it auditable, right? So can we go ahead and look at uh, the decisions that the AI system made, what do they really mean, how does it come to a particular decision, right? And the third thing that we really care is, is it secure? Like, can it be attacked? Can it be exploited in certain way, in certain malicious ways? 
And finally, is it really accountable? Can we keep track of how the AI system was making the decisions and what really changed as we go along, as we train it and as we improve it? Uh, and what are the guarantees that it provides? So just to expand a little bit on those four topics, uh, what we really care about is data quality, right? Uh, what kind of data are we using to train any particular AI model? Uh, and does the model align with the values that we really care about? So, um, and in terms of its robustness, is it robust to any distribution shift? Was it trained with a particular assumptions in the training data and are we applying it in a new, very new scenario where it has never seen before and does it really work well in that scenario or it does not, right? And is it robust to uh, malicious attacks like poisoning or adversarial samples? We'll talk a little bit more about this. And uh, fairness uh, uh, and also interpretability, right? So can we, uh, can we go back and see why the decisions made and can we you know, interpret it in such a way that we can explain it to a uh, different audience, right? And the assurance, uh, we like to think assurance in terms of fact sheets and uh, different ways of maintaining the provenance of the data and the model. So, to, um, so, so we have boiled down these questions into four pillars that we like to uh, talk about. And uh, we think that by, uh, by thinking in these four pillars, we can uh, really enable some concrete solutions to bring trust into our AI system. So the first pillar is fairness, uh, explainability, and then robustness, and then assurance, right? So in the first half, half of the talk, I'll probably give a brief introduction to all of these pillars. And then later on, I'll do a deep dive into the fairness pillar, and uh, Amit is gonna des describe the explainability pillar. And I'll briefly touch upon the robustness and assurance. So let's get started with fairness. So we've seen many high profile cases, uh, case studies where AI has been shown to exhibit uh, some unwanted bias, right? So if you look at some examples here, uh, sentiment analysis, photo classification, job recruiting, uh, there has been case studies where they have been shown to be biased towards certain groups based on race or gender. Uh, adaptive chatbots, they pick up unwanted uh, things that we don't really want it to reflect. And uh, prison sentencing has been shown to have some bias against uh, race. Uh, and there are many recent examples, right? So uh, what do we really mean by unwanted bias? So if you, if you look at AI and machine learning, they are inherently discriminative, right? So. Uh, we have some data and we want to build some classification system in general, and it's trying to look for patterns which are useful for discrimination. So when does discrimination become uh, problematic, right? So when we systematically place some unprivileged group at a disadvantage compared to a privileged group. So I'll define these terms more uh, carefully later on, but to just to give an example, if you're uh, giving credit loan applications, and if your system has systematic errors, uh, and it's always making errors in a particular group, let's say based on gender or age, then we call that there is unwanted bias in the system. Right? So, and in many cases, we really care about this because uh, it's, first of all, it's not moral, and second, it's illegal in many uh, contexts, like housing and financial sector and so on and so forth. So, uh, so where does this really come from, right? So uh, the two main sources of unwanted bias is first of all our training data. And if there is historical prejudice uh, in some outcome variable which we have collected, then that will creep into our models. Right? And uh, the second issue uh, is a little more technical is as in if we have data which is either undersampling some groups or oversampling some groups, then also it can uh, lead to models which exhibit unwanted bias. And you might say that we can just mitigate bias by not including uh, certain uh, sensitive variables, let's say race or age or gender, but uh, it, it's, it's not that easy because there might be a lot of other features 
which are correlated with these sensitive attributes and might still end up make your model biased, right? So it's, it's sometimes it's not easy to pinpoint which variables those are, and sometimes it's uh, hard to get rid of all these correlation. So in this image, I'm showing a particular example, and it was shown that, uh, uh, so th even if you don't incruise, in include demogra uh, demographic information, yeah, the zip code is often correlated with demographic information, and if you just use zip code in your models, you might end up with a biased model. So, so it really needs more deeper thought and much more introspection, and look at the whole AI life cycle of how we build models and deploy models, collect data, and try to look at fairness, measure fairness at all these different steps, and try to mitigate at all these steps. Right? So if you take a typical machine learning pipeline, uh, you have, first you collect data, right? And you do some pre-processing to the data, then you train your model, and then you uh, deploy it, and based on some feedback, you might improve your model. So we might have to intervene in all these steps and improve, improve our models in terms of fairness. Right? So we'll go through all these um, steps in a little more detail in the later half of the talk. So let me jump into the explainability uh, pillar. I'll just give a very brief overview because Amit is gonna cover it. Um, so yeah, if you stare at these headlines, uh, it really shows that the industry really cares about explainable AI. So we might do very well in terms of accuracy, we might do very well in terms of uh, fairness, but if we can't really explain the decision that the model is making, then it's hard to uh, get trust of the users, and thus it sort of reduces our, uh, reduces the adoption rate by the user, right? So, um, I mean, so one quote here is that uh, if we can't explain, then we, you cannot use deep learning kind of systems uh, because of certain legal reasons, right? So we really want to generate some ex explanations uh, but how do we get the right explanation, right? So there, there is no one kind of explanation that will uh, fit all scenarios. It really depends on who the consumer of the explanations is, right? So if it's, it's someone who's building the AI systems, we really need to provide them uh, explanations in terms of how the model is performing and what are the ways it can be improved, right? And if uh, there are some end users, such as some this physici physicians who are consuming the AI models, loan officers, teachers, and so on and so forth, they really care about uh, the trust and the confidence in the model. So if, we, if they're consuming some AI service, they should also know what the confidence of the model is. Is it really confident in the predictions or what are the ways they can go wrong, right? And if they're regulatory bodies, they really care about fairness, uh, they, and they want to make sure that everybody is treated similarly. And uh, most importantly, the affected users, they really want to know why a particular decision was made uh, uh, based on my data, right? And what are the factors that would consider? Is there a way I can change things, improve things, and so on and so forth? So we really need to match the explanations to um, the consumer and the sort of application. Um, we like to think of the explainability dimensions uh, into these three um, uh, axes, right? So the first is um, directly interpretable or post hoc interpretation, right? So if you have, if you are generating explanations, can you uh, look at the model and directly interpret what's going on, or uh, are you generating explanations post hoc? So you train a model, you let it get high accuracy, and then you build post hoc models which will explain the decision. And the second uh, dimension is, is it global versus local? So global means you're explaining the whole model in general, right? And local means given an instance, given a sample, you're trying to come up with explanations as in why this particular decision was made for this particular sample. And the third axis is static versus interactive. So are you just providing explanations once you are done training the model? Or are you uh, allowing the users to interact with the system and uh, gain more sequential ex understanding of the uh, explanation? So just to give a taste of things, um, this is something that I was involved in, and this model is global and directly interpretable. So it's essentially an uh, autoencoder. So it's a variational autoencoder. So you're learning to compress uh, data. 
and then regenerate it. By doing this, you learn some representations which are meaningful, which are also low dimensions. So, so to give an example, let's say you have different chair images, and what you want to do is to learn some representations which will discover the natural concepts, such as what is a chair height, what is a chair's angle, and uh, chair type, and so on and so forth. And if we can get these natural concepts that align with what uh, we as understand or the way we characterize certain things, then uh, we can say that it's much more aligned with our values or our understanding. And we can build really simple models on top of these representations, which will, which will again be explainable, right? So, and uh, you can think of a lot of other applications where we, if we've discovered the true generative factors, then we can induce some invariances, right? So if you are building some system where we know that this particular factor is actually irrelevant to the task I'm solving, then I should uh, first discover that and then make my downstream task uh, invariant to that. So, um, so Amit is going to talk in more about the toolbox and the research that we are doing in that pillar. Let me move on to the next pillar, right? So robustness. So uh, robustness in general means that our models are behaving the way we want them to behave, and are they resilient to malicious behavior, right? Let me start out with some interesting examples. Um, I'm sure you have heard of uh, uh, the adversarial examples, so I'm just giving an example here of that phenomenon. So, uh, so how would you label this image? Um, any guesses? Like ostrich, right? Yeah, cool. So the model says ostrich, that's fine. Now we show this model to the image. Uh, any guesses what the model will predict? It says shoe shop. So, and this, this is the phenomenon of adversarial perturbations, right? So what's happening really is this image here is our original image. It, the AI model predicts it correctly as ostrich, but if you add slight perturbations to that image, which we really can't make out, right? So if you look at all these three images, they look very similar to us, but this one will be categorized as uh, safe, shoe shop, and vacuum, right? So this is what we call as adversarial uh, examples. And this is from one of the best image classifiers. And this phenomenon is not just limited to image classifiers, and we see that it sort of exhibits in all kind of applications. So if you see the application here, um, it's basically doing segmentation. So if you look at the image at the top, this is the input image, and you, the, the model makes a predictions, and then you can see it rightly identifies people. But if you slightly adversarially perturb the image, you see that it's really uh, not different from this image, but the model completely misses the people there. Right? Uh, similarly, other applications, uh, image, uh, image captioning example. So this particular image is captioned right. It finds that it's a, uh, there's a man there. But if you slightly adversarially perturb it, it thinks there's a woman there. Similarly, in NLP, there are examples where it can completely change the meaning by adding uh, words. Uh, and <laughs> so this is an example of speech-to-text example, right? So you can see that uh, the model is able to correctly um, translate the speech-to-text. And if I slightly adversarially perturb the audio signal, you can listen. So it's, it's very similar to what was before, but the model will think of this. Right? I, for one, welcome our computer overlords. Right? So it's really sort of is prevalent in all kind of uh, modalities of the data. And uh, initially, it was thought that the these adversarial perturbations are very fragile. They don't really. Uh, work well when you slightly change the adversarial image or the adversarial sample. But there are a lot of interesting works coming out which show that they are quite robust in terms of uh, the changes of the real world, right? So, it, so in images, it could be change of viewpoint, lighting, and so forth. And in all these cases, uh, the adversarial uh, sample will still be classified in the, into the adversarial class. So if you see this example here, let me just play this video. 
So it. So it correctly classifies as turtle. This is a 3D printed turtle. And then there's an adversarial perturbation, which is again 3D printed. Now the model thinks it's rifle. And you can change its rotation, angle, viewpoint, uh, maybe a bit of lighting. In all these scenarios, it still thinks it's rifle. So these adversarial perturbations are actually quite robust. Right. So, um, so there are two kind of ways we can get adversarial perturbation. So if you have access to all the information about the model, like if you have the complete weights in the case of neural networks uh, and the data, let's say, you could easily create an attack. But we can also do this when we don't have any knowledge about the model or the data. So you could, you could have a black box system, you could repeatedly query it using the image that you have, and if the model provides you of some scores, then you can use those scores to create an attack. So an example here is a bagel image, and then there is this black box attack, and then it classifies it as grand piano. Right? So it, it's really easy to create these attacks, and I think I don't need convincing now that if you want to apply AI to critic any critical systems, you really need to take care of these adversarial samples. So if, for example, self-driving cars, if you have a stop sign, if somebody creates an adversarial perturbation, a slight, maybe some sticker or something, and it can easily fool uh, the system into thinking that it's just a speed limit with infinity. So, um, so where do these adversarial examples come from? I mean, there are a lot of reasons for that. So one of the um, easy way to think of it is that um, so samples which are really close to the decision boundary, they are much more susceptible to the adversarial attacks, right? So uh, here, what I mean by decision boundary is if you have two classes and uh, let's say that the, the decision boundary is, let's say it's in one dimension or two dimensions, it's, it's basically telling you if, you if you have this value, it's gonna be in this class, if you have this value, it's gonna be in this class, and if it's really close to that threshold, then it's very easy to create adversarial attacks. Right? And one of the works that uh, was done in our group is to at least uh, give some sort of guarantee on the samples based on this criteria to make sure that what the samples that you have are not really adversarial. So one way to think about that is to look at the sample and measure how far the sample is from all the decision boundaries and that sort of gives you an estimate of how, um, is, is, is it really an adversarial sample or not. And uh, we also see using these metrics that the bigger and more accurate models seem to be more susceptible to robustness. There's a trade-off between robustness and accuracy in some sense. And uh, there are a lot of other kind of attacks that can be done other than adversarial samples. Uh, you can, uh, there are privacy issues. You might uh, be susceptible f uh, by looking at the model's prediction. Somebody can exactly replicate the data that was trained, uh, that the, was, trained, was used to train the model. And then there could be certain evading uh, techniques that people can use. So we have some work in this area to um, simulate these attacks and get some uh, metrics on how robust a particular model is, what are the guarantees, and I encourage you to check this toolbox. There are nice tutorials and examples walking through the state of the art. Um, so before I uh, move on to um, the deep dive of the toolbox, let me talk a few bits about the assurance aspect, right? So uh, we have fairness in our models, we have explainability, we have robustness, but uh, we need to really have a good way to communicate with the users all these things, right? So we like to think in terms of the, uh, in, in terms of the mechanisms that other industries are using to sort of do this, um, um, job, right? So if you look at the food industry, the financial sector, um, manufacturing, uh, they have these standards, for example, nutrition labels. Uh, they exactly tell you what's in there, how it was processed, what are the ingredients, and uh, for example, you rate the stocks, uh, energy ratings, right? So the toy ratings, IEEE standards, 
So we hope that uh, if we can replicate these kind of standards for AI services and AI models, it's much more easier to communicate what's really go going on with the AI models and probably accelerate the adoption rate. Right? So, so we have sort of a paper on this where we describe this in more detail. You can check this out. Uh, just to give a flavor of what kind of things that uh, that we can say about AI services, um, and they could, it, it could be uh, quite different for different applications, but at least these are some of the templates that that applies to most AI services, right? So some are listed here. So what is the intended use, uh, and um, what is it built for? What are the algorithms and the techniques the service implements? What are the data sets that was used to train and test? Uh, what are the testing methodology? What were the results? And uh, how was the model trained? Uh, was, were there any steps taken to, uh, to protect the privacy and the confidential confidentiality of the training data? Right? And are you, are you aware of examples of bias, ethical issues, or safety risks, results of the, uh, result of the using the service? And does the service implement any fairness checks and bias mitigation? And what is the performance of the service when, the, when it's applied to a, a population of different distribution? Were there checks performed on this aspect? Uh, where, are there any robustness guarantees against adversarial attacks? Uh, and the other provenance kind of things, like when was the service last updated, and so on and so forth. And critically, uh, what are the recommended users, and what does it not recommend it for? So this, I think this really helps in gaining trust of the user to clearly communicate what the service is actually supposed to do and what are its limitations. Right? So let me take a break here and see if there are any questions. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so um, it's, it's for neural networks, right? So I think uh, there are multiple ways of doing it. So um, one of the ways is to look at the confidence predictions, right? So we can look at confidence predictions. And I mean, I agree that it's really, neural networks are really high dimensions. So it's difficult to get what the exact decision boundary is. So we could do some simple uh, sort of analysis, sort of maybe we can compress down the neural network to lower dimensions and see uh, how the model behaves when, it, uh, so when in the lower dimension, right? The other ways is to um, solve a sort of optimization problem. So you, you have a sample X, let's say, and then you start adding small perturbations to it, and then you find the smallest perturbation which will change the class label. That's one way to do it, but uh, yeah, the, everything has limitations, so it's still ongoing research. So I think I think in that work, I think that's what that's what was done. So you you take two label pairs and then you add perturbations to the samples and then see when it sort of changes. And if the distance, the perturbation is large, then it's sort of away from the decision boundary. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So that's, that's an ongoing work, I guess. So at calibration, I think that's technically, it's called calibration, and it's a really big issue in neural networks as well. So there are ad hoc calibration techniques. So you could take the neural networks and recalibrate them based on the predictions on a large population. And there are some works, at least the re, there was recent work that we did where, um, so we have two networks. So one is the main network, which is trying to be as accurate as possible. And then we have an auxiliary network which will actually predict the confidence intervals or the uh, the confidence scores, uh, if you will. So, and I mean, one of the problems that we saw was if you combine this in one model, you will end up hurting the accuracy. So, you, so, so our sort of approach was to have a separate network which will predict these confidence scores, and those confidence scores have a calibration loss on them. 
and then uh, ideally you can achieve calibration at the at the cost of accuracy right you can have a really high calibrated model but it will be pretty bad so so we sort of made this disjoint and made sure that the the confidence intervals are calibrated but it actually helps the prediction task so so what you want is your scores uh, should be calibrated but they should be as um, concentrated or as peaky in some sense as possible. So you don't want confidence scores which are all like um, non-uniform across all classes. So that will definitely lead to calibration, but it won't lead to good accuracy. So yeah, good questions. <laughs> okay, so yeah, let me take a break for 10 minutes here. And uh, so this is the link for the toolbox UI. And we have these download links here. And we have a Slack community also. So I'd encourage you to sign up to this Slack channel. And we have a, a vibrant community there uh, to interact and learn more. And uh, yeah, and um, uh, any questions for me are welcome. And in the Slack channel are also welcome. And I'll pause here for 10 minutes. And if somebody wants to try installing it or play with the UI, they are more than welcome to do. And if there are any questions and in installations, I can help out. And let's pause for 10 minutes. So let's go through the glossary a little bit so that we understand the terms. Um, so some of the important ones are label. And this is the value corresponding to a particular outcome variable. right? So for example, if it's a loan decision, it's, it's basically was the loan approved or not, um, so on and so forth. And uh, so favorable label. So if a particular population uh, thinks that this label is advantageous to them, that's called as favorable label. For example, not going to prison is favorable. Getting the loan approved is favorable. Right? And then features. So features are all the other attributes for a particular person that will um, help in predicting the outcome variable. And the uh, model and classifier are basically the model that predicts the outcome variable. Right? And the score is something that uh, certain kind of models can provide you other than the um, the outcome variable, right? The label. It could be um, um, confidence scores, or it could be some other score that is uh, measuring how confident it is about the outcome variable that it's predicting. And uh, so let's look at some uh, keywords that are particular to fairness. So predicted attribute. I already mentioned this, but to define it, this can be any attribute, which um, uh, which sort of groups the population into uh, different categories and which are historically considered to be sensitive or um, uh, protected, right? These include like race, gender, caste, religion, uh, and there could be a whole host of other uh, variables that could be sensitive depending on the application. And uh, so what is privileged protected attribute? Um, so these are the groups which have been considered historically to be at a systematic advantage, right? So, and then uh, group fairness refers to the fact that we are trying to um, measure fairness across groups, so compare one group to another. And individual fairness is when we are trying to make sure that um, a particular person's decisions or outcome variables made by a model is fair. Right? And then uh, uh, what do we mean by bias? I already defined bias. Uh, Bias is a systematic error, and uh, in the fairness construct, it's unwanted bias. Right? And then fairness metric is ways of quantifying the unwanted bias. And these typically include um, the data set, the outcome variable that the model is predicting, and the sensitive attributes that are associated uh, with those um, data set. Right? And then in some cases, we can have an explainer which provides the explanations. It could be explaining the fairness metric, or it could be explaining the model, and so on and so forth. So let's dive into some metrics to uh, get an understanding of how these work. So I'm showing a situation here. And uh, so you can see there are 10 um, people here in the unprivileged group on the top row. And then there are 10 people in the bottom row who are uh, from the privileged group. And uh, the shaded um, people are uh, people who got uh, the, model, the model predicted the labels correctly. 
and the unshaded is where the model made the error, right? And you can see in this scenario, uh, we s there are equal number of samples in both groups, and the, the number of errors is similar across the both groups, right? So let's change the duration slightly, and uh, if the model predicts one more sample from the unprivileged group as a negative, then that becomes, uh, uh, that, that's an error from the model part. And if you look at the, the positives and the negative distribution, it has changed now. So let's compute some metric. Uh, the first fairness metric that's commonly used is called statistical parity difference. And it's, mo it's looking at selection rates, right? So if positive is a favorable label, it's trying to compute what fraction of the population of each group uh, gets the positive label or the favorable label. So in this case, the top row for the unprivileged group, you can see that six out of 10 were classified as positive. So the favorable outcome rate here is 60%. And in the privileged group, uh, seven uh, out of the 10 were classified as positive. So in this case, the favorable outcome rate is 70%. And if you look at their difference, it's uh, negative 10%. Right? So ideally, when we want fairness, we want this difference to be as small as possible. So we want it to be zero, ideally. So let's look at a slightly different uh, metric. It's called equal opportunity difference. Here we actually look for the true positive rate, right? So there are seven true positives, and the model got five of them, right? So the ratio is five over seven, in percentage it's 71%. And for the privileged group, it got six correct out of the seven true positives. So that's 86%. And again, we can look at the difference, and this difference tells us the difference in the accuracy in some sense. So um, that was metrics, and there are a lot of other metrics. We'll go into uh, some discussion into when to use, what metric, and why do we need so many metrics. But uh, just to conclude the glossary part, let's look at some of the bias mitigation algorithm. Right? So you, you measured bias, and then you want to mitigate that bias. And as I was saying before, in, in a machine learning life cycle, you can mitigate bias at the training data step, you can mitigate bias at the model learning step, and then you can mitigate, if you don't have control over the model or the data, you can finally take the model predictions and try to somehow change them to uh, imbibe more fairness, right? So concretely, uh, it, we call trans, uh, any procedure that modifies data set or model as a transformer. And bias mitigation algorithm is any algorithm which tries to make the model or the data fair. And pre-processing algorithm is something that is applied on the training data. In-processing algorithm is uh, any modifications to the model training that leads to fairness. And post-processing algorithm is when we actually intervene on the predicted labels and try to make them more fair. And so let's look at some examples of bias mitigation algorithms. And uh, this was something I was involved in. Uh, it's, it's called Fairness GAN. And we are trying to generate, take the existing data sets and try to make them more fair. And if you've heard of GANs, GANs are currently a good way to generate data sets. So what's essentially happening here, if you take the traditional GAN, it usually has a generator. You, you feed in some noise vector to it, and it generates a sample which looks very close to your uh, training data, right? And if you just learn a GAN, it will get all the properties of your training data. But if we know that the training data should have certain fairness constraints, we have a way of imposing that here, right? So one fairness metric that we can think of is that the outcome variable and the um, sensitive attribute, D in this case, should uh, be in some sense independent, or rather just the outcome variable should not contain any information about the sensitive attribute. So, so the way we do it here is we employ an additional classifier or discriminator, which is, which is trying to predict the gender, in this case, from the uh, outcome variable, right? 
And the generator's objective is to fool this discriminator. So the result of this optimization would be that the Y will sort of become independent of the, the outcome variable will become independent of the, um, of the predator attribute, right? In this case, gender. So uh, this is one way of making sure that the, the data set that we produce has these fairness constraint. And uh, there are other techniques also uh, where you could take individual samples and try to make them more fair. Uh, so here, uh, this was the New Europe 2017 work where we uh, pose this as an optimization problem where we take a particular sample and then we imbibe some fairness constraint into it while satisfying the constraint that it should be similar to what uh, it was before, right? So we don't want the samples to lose their utility or move too far away from what they were actually representing before. So uh, this is just a very high level overview of these algorithms. Um, so let's look at the bigger picture here. So um, I showed this picture before. So uh, we can see where all we can intervene here. So we have our training data. We can get the data set. We can compute the fairness metrics at the data set level, right? And optionally, we can have some explainer which can explain these metrics much better. We can intervene at this stage using any pre-processing algorithm. So the two examples that we saw, uh, saw before were examples of pre-processing. Uh, so we can apply this, get a more fair data set, and then train our model. So the other step where we can intervene is the model training step. So as I mentioned, we can use any in-processing algorithms to enforce additional constraints during model training. And once we train our model, we'll get our predictions, and we can also intervene at this very late stage and try to massage the predictions somehow that it ensures fairness. Right? So you might ask why so many definitions of fairness and uh, why so many different algorithms, right? So, and uh, the reason is, um, there is it's, it's, fairness is quite um, context dependent and really depends on what kind of application we are talking about and who are the people who are affected, who are the consumers. So um, there is a nice talk that Professor Arvind Narayan gave at the Fat Star 2018, uh, the tutorial. It talks about all the fairness metrics in detail and it uh, gives some case studies and examples which shows that uh, what kind of metric should be used in which cases. And there are also um, impossibility uh, theorems which tells that it's not possible to satisfy all the fairness metrics simultaneously. So it really uh, requires more careful thinking about what the application is, who are the stakeholders, and really talk to them, and uh, then figure out what's the right uh, way to go about this. So, so with this in mind, we developed a toolbox that we call as AI Fairness 360. And the really goal is to have a comprehensive uh, fairness metrics toolbox and a bias mitigation toolbox. So any uh, researcher or practitioner can look at the data, look at their models, and try out all different metrics and bias mitigation algorithms, and then uh, use this as a first step to investigate the problem and then talk to the stakeholders and then come up with the right metric for their application. So to get started, we have a bunch of data sets already in the toolbox, which the users can play with. And we have more than 30 metrics and explanations. I think we have around 10 bias mitigation algorithms right now. And we provide some guidance over what metric to use when and what algorithms to use. And we have some industry-specific tutorials also to get started. And uh, we think that we have made it really extensible, and it is compatible with scikit uh, fit and predict paradigm. So it should fit in existing workflows. Uh, and uh, hopefully, the technical debt is not too much. Um, just to give a taste of what kind of metrics are there, so we have, uh, I showed selection-based metric. So we have group fairness metrics based on selection rate. We have confusion metrics-based group fairness metrics and uh, sample distortion metrics. Uh, consistency is one metric where uh, it's measuring individual fairness. And we have uh, generalized entropy index. It's 
somehow tries to combine individual fairness and group fairness. And uh, these are the bias mitigation algorithms. These are really all the work the community has done. Uh, some of the algorithms are done in-house at IBM Research, but really they're all the other algorithms which the researchers in the academic community have developed. Right? And uh, we try to cover the span of the three categories of algorithms that I showed before so that it's uh, comprehensive. So, uh, so we also have a web demo. I can try to go through it, and uh, it's really meant as a starting point uh, to users and get a really good quick overview of how um, the toolbox is organized and if somebody wants to get started uh, on understanding the fairness metrics and the algorithms, it's a good point to start with. <coughs> Let me try to start the web demo. So we have uh, three data sets, the compass data set, the German credit scoring data sets and the adult census income. Let me use the adult data set. So the first step is to take the training data and uh, check for biases in the training data. And we're showing, so the, in this particular data set, there are two protected attributes. One is race, the other is gender. Um, and you can see looking at these metrics, that uh, there is some bias existing in the data set. Right? So the statistical parity difference should be smaller, should be closer to zero. Uh, this seems to be fine, and the disparate impact is in the red region. So the red region indicates that there is larger bias than um, we consider acceptable. So go to the next step and try out some of the algorithms. So let's try out the adversarial debiasing algorithm. It's, it's an in-processing algorithm, so it's, it's trying to learn a predictor, right? And while ensuring the predictions are accurate, it's also ensuring that the predictions does not contain any information about the sensitive attribute. And this, this is done in adversarial training uh, optimization. So let's apply this algorithm and look at the results. So you can see that the algorithm improves the fairness metrics in, uh, in both protected attributes. Uh, particularly, the statistical parity difference goes uh, much closer to zero, and it improves on a bunch of metrics as well. And we can also look at the accuracy. In this case, the accuracy seems to go down uh, quite a bit, but it's still within an acceptable region. And there's a trade-off going on here between Fairness and accuracy, that is something to keep in mind. And it really needs, uh, we really need to think how much we want to trade off both cases. Let's go back and try a different algorithm. Let's try the reviewing algorithm. Uh, this can be thought as in processing as post processing as well. So it, it, it uh, takes the predictions and tries to come up with some weights for the samples, which will lead to more fair prediction. If we apply this algorithm, right, so we can see that in this case, the accuracy doesn't go down much. It went from 82 to 81, but um, the improvement in fairness is a little less compared to the adversarial training. So, so we can try out different algorithms and really depends on our fairness budget and accuracy budget, and that really should determine what algorithm to use. So um, so that was the demo of just using this. Let me just walk through this website so that um, you can get familiar with this interface. So, um, so we have the API docs here. You can go here and check out all the different metrics and algorithms. You can even go to each of them and look at the citation and uh, get more details about those algorithms. And uh, so we have a paper on this, which provides more details. And we have uh, tutorials that go through certain industry case studies. And we have uh, notebooks, which goes through all the algorithms into a little bit more detail and uh, gives uh, uh, examples of how to use these algorithms. 
and uh, we have an events tab which uh, shows what what all the tutorials that we conducted and there are some video tutorials and some of them go into much more depth so you can uh, watch these and get more information and i pointed out to the community before uh, please join the slack channel and please uh, and everybody is to welcome uh, everybody is welcome to contribute and uh, uh, grow the community and the toolbox itself. So let me go back to the slides. Uh, are there any questions at this point? Yeah. Oh, the, that's a good question. Let me see. I think if I remember, there is no way right now to export the data, but I can pass that uh, request to the developers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was answering about the demo, but yeah, yeah. So the demo is, yeah, yeah. I mean, the demo is really to get started and to get a, get a taste of the data sets and the algorithms. So we do have detailed notebooks. So I actually intended to show one notebook and maybe that should, that's pretty straightforward. It's just to put a notebook and you can run through the whole process and then actually export the data and uh, do any further processing. So yeah, I mean, we can take a look at this notebook. So. Oh, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, we like to think in terms of the accuracy and mitigation uh, trade-off, right? So you could try out, so the, first of all, you need to determine what metrics to use, and that's also application dependent. You could actually run all the metrics, because it's pretty straightforward to do that. You can get all the metrics, but really, again, there is no automated way to finally conclude th that this metric is better than this metric. So it really depends on the application and the stakeholders. So what we sort of try to enable is have the data, have some sense of protected attributes and labels, compute all the metrics, try different bias mitigation algorithms, and then present it to users, and then let them make the choice of which is, uh, which is sort of applicable in this case, and then let them take the decision if they consider this as a valuable thing or not. Uh, that's that's finally applied to the model loss, right? Oh, yeah. But yeah, because uh, you, you you get some 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 sort of weights for each samples, and then you could use that during the loss. So instead of using a unweighted loss, you'll use those weights to sort of um, modify the loss, right? So if you have a sample, if it has a certain weight, you would use that in the loss. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, let's go a little bit deeper into the adversarial uh, debiasing algorithm. Is it clear? Let's make it bigger. <coughs> so yeah, these are the standard import statements. So uh, we'll import the data set. Um, uh, this is the, the our base data set class. Uh, it's called binary label data set. So this is useful when your outcome variable is binary, like zero or one. And uh, then I'm importing the, the data sets that are baked in into the toolbox, the adult data set, the German data set, and the compass data set. And we are importing a bunch of metrics as well. <coughs> and uh, I'm importing the adversarial debiasing algorithm here, and a uh, bunch of other things that we'll use later. And the first step really is to uh, load the data set, right? So, uh, we have a helper function for the uh, data sets that are baked in, and uh, you can follow this particular function, and if you have your own data set, you can model the pre-processing uh, using this particular helper function. Uh, once you get the data set in a form that is compatible with the toolbox, 
you can uh, then specify what are the privileged groups and what are the unprivileged groups. So in this case, uh, gender one is the privileged group. I think that's male, and the unprivileged group is uh, female. Right? And then you can split the data set into training and test. And I'm printing out a bunch of different uh, properties of the data set. This is the shape. There are these many samples and these many features the favorable and unfavorable labels, the protected attributes, and then all the features that go into the modeling. And the first thing that you can do is take this training data set, specify the privileged and unprivileged group, and then use the binary label data set metric to compute a bunch of metrics. So this class will go ahead and compute all the metrics associated with the data set right, at the data set level. And I'm printing out here the um, the mean difference, right, between the accuracies. We can see that between the privileged and unprivileged group, there is a quite a bit of difference. So let's go ahead and build a model. I think in this case, I'm using a simple linear regression. So once we learn the model, we can get the predictions of the model, and then again, we can compute these fairness metrics. And you can see that the, um, the, the, the model uh, preserves the biases that were there in the original data set, right? So now let's uh, call the adversarial debiasing algorithm. Let's initialize it and then fit it using our training data set. And uh, this is a neural network-based bias mitigation algorithm, so it's, it's doing its optimization. And we'll stop, stop after a certain number of iterations or conversions. And then let's use this and uh, get our new predictions. So we can, once we get the predictions, we can do the same step, compute the metrics for this, and uh, let's look at the, uh, let's look at the metrics again, right? So the classification accuracy doesn't go too much, and uh, right, let's me jump ahead to the results. So yeah, so let's compare the original fairness metrics and after debiasing, and we can see it's 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 really mitigating bias, not eliminating it. So because there's a trade-off between accuracy and fairness, but we can see that it does really improve on the fairness metrics. And the accuracy originally was 80%, and then it changes to 79%. So it's 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 not reducing it by too much. Uh, I skipped over a lot of details, but uh, my idea was to give a notion of how the notebooks are structured, how you can load a data set, compute fairness metrics on the data set, on a simple model without any debiasing, and then try out the bias mitigation algorithms, and then compare the model with debiasing and without debiasing. Are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good point. So that actually uh, goes to my next slide. <laughs> so, okay, so what scenarios can we use a toolbox? I mean, that's a very good question, and that's valid concern for many of the applications. But at least in this, the kind of uh, application areas that we are targeting is when there is a good notion, established notion of protected attribute, and there's a good notion of outcome variable. And those outcome variables are uh, actually collected by some humans. Humans have made some allocative decisions, and the toolbox is much more appropriate in this, those scenarios. Uh, when in cases where there is either there is no understanding of what the product attribute is, or it's not available, it's a little more tricky. So uh, the toolbox doesn't really cover that right now. But one thing that we could do is apply individual fairness. So individual fairness doesn't really look at sensitive attribute or protected attribute, all you're saying is similar people should be treated similarly. So we have the metric called consistency, and there is a lot of work coming into uh, in that area. And then uh, 
There are other notions of privacy where you should not, uh, the model should not have any knowledge about the group identity or uh, you could create artificially subgroups among your population and then the model should not predict those identities and so on and so forth. But yeah, th those things are not really covered in the toolbox right now. That's a good question. Um, so we did some recent work uh, that covers that. So most of the algorithms, bias mitigation algorithms that are in the toolbox right now, they work with binary uh, product attributes. But if you think of the metrics, all the metrics can be expressed as some sort of conditional independence. So let's say we are looking at the statistical parity. We really want the outcome variable Y to be independent of the sensitive attribute. And uh, let's say we are doing the equalize odds. So you are saying that the, um, the outcome variable that the model is predicting should be independent of the sensitive attribute given the true labels. So you can express these metrics as conditional independence tests. And there are some algorithms out there which enforce this conditional independence. So, but is there not there in the toolbox right now? So we hope to include that in sometime soon. Yeah, that's a good point. I think uh, in that aspect, we have welcome contribution. So we really need some uh, statistical significance test in the toolbox. I'm not aware. I, mean, I think there are some trade-offs that we show, but I think uh, having statistical significance test will really helpful to know why the difference, is the difference really significant or not? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, I think that'll be valuable to have, yes. Right. right. Yeah, I think if you consider the toolbox, I think the way we could do that is to sort of enforce all of them simultaneously. So consider them as an independent uh, attribute and then have a loss which works on all the uh, sensitive attributes. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. I don't think we support that in the toolbox right now as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's open source and it's, everybody is welcome to make contribution. We really hope the community builds on it and really uses it. So yeah, on that note, I also have a slide which I don't have here now. But I could mention this, right? So the toolbox is also part of uh, Linux Foundation for AI and uh, it's really being supported through that foundation and I think it's open to members and contributors and um, yeah, we're really excited about it being part of the Linux Foundation. So we really hope that all these issues that we are seeing here, which are missing, are added to the toolbox and uh, people make use of it. Yeah. Uh, is there a trade-off? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the, it really depends on the algorithm, but in the adversarial debiasing algorithm that I showed before, it has these parameters uh, which will actually control. So the loss is basically two components. One loss is accuracy, the other loss is the loss, adversarial loss, which is trying to uh, remove all the information in the outcome variable about the sensitive attributes. So there is a lambda parameter which weights these losses, and you can tune that. Yeah, and you can use a validation set and tune it based on the validation set. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, if um, it so it really depends on how biased the data is, and if the if it is completely biased, if there is no way to recover it, uh, it might be pretty hard. So you could try out different algorithms like pre-processing. Maybe that's very difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, there are yeah there are ways to change data sets. You could change. You would intervene at the later stage of uh, post-processing. Uh, so as in take the prediction that the model is predicting and then try to make them arbitrarily fair, right? You okay. could do that, but I'm not sure how good the accuracy will be when you do that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think you can interpret many of the metrics in that sense, right? So I think uh, the best way to uh, improve fairness metrics is to add more data, right? And if you see that the model is behaving bad in a particular metric for a particular group, and it will always help to add more data in that group. And because, as I said, there are two reasons. One is historical bias. The other is just pure undersampling or sampling issues. So if you could try that and see if it helps or not. Is that yeah. Yes, yeah. Okay, so uh, a bit more thoughts before we conclude. Um, I think there were questions on what metric to use. So we have some considerations that I've listed here. So the consideration, uh, the first consideration is, oh. okay, so, do we want individual fairness? Do we care about group fairness? Or do we care about both? Right? So uh, currently, we have consistency metric. And that's one way to measure individual fairness. And there are a whole uh, bunch of metrics for group fairness. And there are quite a few which work on both. So you really need to think about your application and decide which metrics you really care about. And the second one is, are you trying to just estimate the data bias or the model bias? Uh, we talked about this. And the third consideration is um, uh, how, do you, uh, how do you think about the metrics? Is it, do we consider that everybody is equal or do you really trust the, the ground truth labels? So in the, in the case of ground truth labels, what we can call it as what you see is what you get. So we, we have ground truth data, we sort of trust them and we want our models to reflect that ground truth. So in that case, we can use average odds difference, which really cares about how accurate the model is in different groups. So we really care about the accuracy of the model across groups. But if you really think that everybody is equal, there is historical bias, then uh, we should care about statistical parity difference. So it cares about selection rates. So we want, let's say we are doing loan approval, we want all the groups to have similar rates of selection. So that's one consideration. And uh, the fourth consideration is just pure human factor. Some people prefer ratios, some people pe uh, prefer differences. So uh, I mainly showed differences-based metrics, but uh, uh, in a lot of industries, uh, people also use disparate impact, which is a ratio-based metric. So it computes the uh, scores or metrics for the groups, and then it tries to get the ratio and see if the ratio is close to one or not. So uh, that's just purely how you want to present your results, and that's something important to consider as well. So I'll conclude now, and uh, I think we'll have one, a little bit of time for questions, or if you, if anybody wants to try the uh, notebooks or the toolkit, if you have any questions, setting up, installing, and so forth. So yeah, so let's, let's see the concluding remarks. Uh, I think AI fairness and explainability are uh, key factors which will help us push the boundaries of AI and move them to really high-stake applications while gaining the trust of users, right? So it really will help unlock all the benefits into all these areas which are um, critical, but also needs a lot of intuition and explanation and trust from users. And uh, it's very rapidly evolving. There are a lot of metrics being proposed every now and then. There are a lot of definitions. So we really need to take a look at all the possible metrics and uh, then make a decision. And uh, we definitely need to talk to all the stakeholders when doing this because different people have, might have different notions of fairness. And, uh, and the second point is we need to evaluate the security and robustness of our systems and make sure that they work as intended. And finally, we need a way to communicate uh, transparently the behavior of the AI models and the parameters in which they should be applied and in which they should not be applied. So uh, we hope that these uh, pillars of trust will be useful in uh, improving the trustworthiness of our AI systems and help extract the most benefit of them.
Thank you. Questions? Oh, um, it's specific to the data set, and the 50 was arbitrarily set for the uh, demo purpose because the notebooks should be run in a quick time, right? But it really depends on the application of the data set. So ideally, you would want to have a validation set and try out the metrics and the accuracy on a validation set and then do early stopping or other kind of things. Yeah. Okay, there are no questions. Yeah, I'll be around if anybody wants to. Oh, is there a question? That's a good question. Um, there are a lot of new notions of fairness based on causality. So there is counterfactual fairness, and there is path-specific fairness metrics. So there is a lot of work going on in there right now. Um, so you can imagine uh, the famous Berkeley admission study where uh, um, so there was a discussion, is the admissions biased towards uh, female? So, uh, but there is some ongoing discussion over, is it because of the uh, department-based uh, rates, or are they applying to certain departments, which is higher uh, competition, and so on and so forth. So these are called like path-specific uh, notions of fairness. And in some cases, it might be OK to, uh, so ideally we want the outcome variable y to have no dependence on the protected attribute, right? So in this case, let's say the admission uh, outcome and the gender, they should not have any dependence, but in path-specific notion of fairness, we are saying that it's okay to have a path to certain variables. So in this case, the department, let's say. So there are some, th those are possible if you know the causal graph of the model. So if you know that uh, this is the data, and this data was generated using this causal graph, then you can make those reasonings as well. So, um, and, um, and, and all the metrics that we looked at are purely statistical. So they all are looking at observational data. And if we have a causal graph, then we can do much more than just look at observational data. So, yeah. Uh, what do you mean by that? Yeah, um, I think it's possible, right? So you could, uh, so are you saying that if I have a fair model, it should transfer to another model? Yeah, I think there are some works in that direction where if they are doing transfer learning from one model to another, they also want to ensure that the fairness properties of the model that is being transferred from also is maintained. There are some works around that. I think uh, it really depends on how you want to constrain the transfer. And uh, I'm not sure if there are good ways to do that, but I think a simple way would be to do this transfer learning, but also have this additional constraint of fairness. OK, thanks, everyone. So stop here and uh, ask me if you have any questions uh, offline. Thanks.